Good afternoon and welcome to this talk on a voyage around the Scottish islands. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Matt Curator at the National Library of Scotland, where I've worked since 1994. My main job at the library has been creating and maintaining our MAPS website, where we now make freely available over a quarter of a million high resolution images of MAPS. Now, before we set out on our voyage, it's important to have a suitable map to hand. And Nicholas de Nicolay's chart of the 1580s will do very nicely. This was one of the most geographically accurate charts of Scotland from the 16th century right through to the 18th century, because it was based on the written descriptions of a master mariner, a man called Alexander Lindsay, who amongst other things accompanied King James V on his voyage of 1540. James set sail on the 12th of June 1540 from Leith and his voyage lasted the best part of a year taking in Orkney, Skye, Lewis, parts of Westeros and Kintail before disembarking at Dumbarton. The voyage was an important one for military and political reasons, partly as a show of strength to daunt the Isles. And as for his father before him, for James to meet with various clan chiefs and receive their submission to his authority. And we're going to retrace that route today, though hopefully a little faster than King James. And we're also traveling in a vessel specially adapted for this talk. It can tra travel backwards and forwards in time, as well as across the sea. And as we set off into the Firth of Forth, it's important to make a few safety announcements to all the passengers. The first is that Scotland's islands were rarely romantic, palm-fringed paradises, but rather they were firmly enmeshed in the wider history of Scotland. At times violent, such as these German maps during the Second World War, and at other times they had their own fair share of poverty, famine and destitution. They were never simply otherworldly or magical. Maps can offer a powerful view into the history of particular islands at specific points in time not just by illustrating what was there, but through illustrating the broader social, political, or economic contexts. In other words, what else was going on? Looked at in this way, maps become a window into Scottish history, and our voyage to the islands looks through a window into the history of the Scottish islands. It's beautiful hand-drawn and coloured plan of Inchcombe Island by the antiquarian Charles Hutton in 1822 illustrates this point nicely. Hutton was drawn to Inchcombe by its Augustinian monastery, we can see in the centre of the island here, which dated from the 12th century, and its related ruins and inscriptions on stones. But he also carefully drew gun batteries constructed during the recent Napoleonic Wars to guard against possible French attack. In fact, in earlier centuries, Inchcombe had been the subject of a number of invasions by English forces who plundered the monastery. But following the Reformation and the demise of the Abbey, the island's strategic location in the fourth resulted in it being fortified against new enemies. Inchcombe was remanned for defence in March 1915, this time against a German enemy, with a battery of eight 12-pounder quick-firing guns and three defence electric lights, a couple of which can be seen to the lower left here. These were powerful searchlights to illuminate targets at night. And the guns and lights were intended to protect an anti-submarine boom that controlled access up the fall from this point. The primary concern at the start 
of the First World War had been to protect anchorages west of the Fourth Bridge, closer to Rosyth. But then the focus moved steadily to the east, with new lines of defence and batteries on Inch Keith, Inchcombe, and Inch Mickery. This very large scale plan that we're looking at of Inchcombe by the War Office is, in fact, the most detailed survey ever done of the island. It was at a scale of 30 feet to the inch, part of a set of 20th century military maps of Scotland we just put online last month. And it allows the terrain and defences to be scrutinised in minute detail, with seemingly every inch of the island remodelled for military purposes. The First World War was, perhaps more than any previous conflict, a war of maps. Vast quantities of maps were produced to illustrate all aspects of the main theatres of war. Scotland was fortunately on the periphery of these main theatres and so saw a smaller number of military maps. In fact, as we sail away eastwards from Inchcombe to visit the Bass Rock through this lazy summery view, it might seem as if we've left warfare completely behind, but not so. This is in fact a view by Captain John Sletzer, who held the post of Chief Engineer in Scotland from 1671, a position which involves surveying the country's major fortifications and castles. Sletzer provides us with a rare view of the Bass Castle fortifications with battlemented parapets, a curtain wall running at right angles to the sea, close to the landing place, and three buildings within the walls. The Bass Rock was fortified from the early 15th century at least, and in the 1650s it was used as a base to harass English supply ships during the Cromwellian invasion of Scotland. From 1671 it acted as a prison for, for covenanters. With the abdication of James VII in 1688, the Covenanters were released, but its owners remained faithful to King James, and at the time of this view, the Jacobites held the castle until 1694, when they were finally granted amnesty. But other things don't change, including the seabirds we saw earlier circling overhead. And today, an estimated 150,000 gannets breed on the Bass Rock making it the world's largest gannet colony, and perhaps therefore both the, the noisiest and smelliest island in Scotland. Now on our way north, guided by Laurie and Whittle's chart of the 1790s, we pass the Inch Cape Rock. We can see over here to the centre right, the scene of countless shipwrecks over the centuries. And here, of course, Robert Stevenson, and John Rennie were to construct their famous Bell Rock Lighthouse between 1807 and 1810. And the successful completion of this work was very much the basis for securing the lasting fame of the Stevenson family as civil engineers, some of whose work we have recently put online in the last year. Stevenson's account of the Bell Rock Lighthouse published much later in 1824 that we're looking at here, was very much a commemorative work. And it also included detailed maps of the island or reef of the Bell Rock, with every section and outcrop named, often given names of people associated with the construction project. So we head on north, past Buckenness and Ratchery Head near Peterhead. And on passing Duncansby Head, the northeastern tip of the Scottish mainland, armed now with Murdo Mackenzie's famous maps of Orkney, we find ourselves being swirled around in a giant eddy off the island of Swona in the Pentland Firth. This was, and still is, a dangerous stretch of water with major whirlpools on different sides of the island with the flood and ebb of the tide. 
Swona was actually populated at this time, settled in fact right through to the 1970s, even though it's now uninhabited. And as we reach Orkney, it's worth taking a moment to look at one of its most famous map makers or hydrographers, Murdo Mackenzie, who initiated major advances in Scottish hydrographic surveying. Mackenzie came from the, the farm of groundwater that we can see in the center top of this slide on the Orkney mainland. And he charted the coasts of Orkney between 1744 and 1748. Mackenzie owed his employment to the patronage of James Douglas, the 14th Earl of Morton, whose estates included Orkney. And he also benefited from being taught by Colin McLaurin, who is Professor of Mathematics at the University of Edinburgh. And he taught the principles of mapping and trigonometry as part of his classes. Mackenzie's importance rests on his innovative combination of methods, beginning with the use of triangulation from a measured baseline. Beacons or landmarks were built up on the summits of all the major hills. And he took advantage of a hard frost to put up his theodolite and measure his baseline on the frozen lock of Stenhouse or Stenness as it is today in the center of the Orkney mainland. From there, he built up a network of triangles. The keys or legends on his map show the range of information that he covered and the detailed categorization of features. They also went round the coast, marking on rough drafts the true shapes of heads, points and bays. Boats were positioned to lie at different extremities. When a complete map of the island was made out, Mackenzie went around the island by boat, taking soundings for depth, measuring the rate of tide, and taking notes of landmarks for avoiding rocks and so on. And this whole process, he tells us, was repeated island by island to build up a composite map. It set an important precedent for map makers to map from the land as well as the sea, with much better results obtained by doing this. Mackenzie's charts also include a great deal of landward information as we can see here for the island of Sunday. And these include the prominent dikes between the infield and outfield, showing the distinction between arable and pasture ground, as these were useful for mariners. We sail off now to the north, passing briefly by Fair Isle, seen through Mackenzie's fine chart and uh, landward profile below. And then we travel back in time too, to reach Shetland in the mid 17th century. In the 16th and 17th centuries, the Dutch had a virtual monopoly on catching herring in the North Sea. And their huge fishing fleets, often numbering thousands of boats, regularly swept by the coasts of Shetland. It's possible too, to an extent, to trace the rise and fall of the great maritime nations of Europe through their sea charts. The Dutch invention of jibbing in the late 15th century, that is preserving partially gutted herring in barrels with salt, allowed catches to be preserved at sea and also enabled longer voyages to follow the fish. The main catches of North Sea herring could be found feeding and spawning in the summer over a wide area near to Shetland and Orkney and down Scotland's east coast. The Dutch also successfully adapted a variant of the original Viking longship, popularly known as the Busa, an open top cargo boat. And the Dutch herring bus was very much a factory vessel, ideally suited to storing large drift nets, barrels and salt, Together with their acknowledged expertise in catching and curing fish, the Dutch developed an onshore processing industry, allowing exports of the salted herring over Europe, 
and they develop related trades of making nets, shipbuilding, navigation, as well as drawing charts. And this chart, if we're finally getting to here, orientated with West to the top by Jacob Collum, shows really the outlines and place names from the earlier Wagner family of Dutch charts. Colum was a printer and bookseller who settled in Amsterdam from 1622. And the chart shows how some of the original Norse names were rendered into Dutch, such as Soonberger Hoost, as we can see on this side for Sumber Head, or Bolton's Sont for Bolter Sound. And names too, such as Hamburger Haven or Bremer Haven, also indicate the importance of Dutch fisheries and trade in Shetland at this time. And this chart was included in a pilot volume, the Veerig Column, which was translated into English as the Fiery Sea Column, which was a pun both on the author's name as well as on the name of his house in Amsterdam. And Colin's title was a, also an allusion to the biblical pillar of fire, which guided the Israelites out of Egypt. This splendid title page of the volume shows this brilliantly illuminated pillar guiding several ships in full sail. Below the cartouche, we can see a man on the left holding an astrolabe and another man holding a plumb line. Down below, further nautical surveying instruments can be seen, including dividers, a crosta, and astrolabes. The expertise of their men distilled into a copy of the fiery sea column that we can see open at the title page. So, time to get back on board again, as we're now off to Lewis, tacking into the wind, whilst we pass by the remote islands of Rona and Sulaskir on our way. Or do we? Some islands have found that their location and size means that they somehow never quite make the cut onto a map of their own and always end up destined to be an inset on a map of somewhere else. Insets, of course, are very handy things for map makers but rarely of much value for us as map users. Do we really have any idea where these rocks are from a map like this? Many of our surviving maps of the Western Isles were driven by economic factors, early estate surveyors looking at agricultural improvements, geological maps showing economically valuable rocks, and later sporting maps looking at deer forests for shooting. In the last 30 years, there has been much more focus in the history of cartography, not so much on what maps are, but on what maps do. In other words, what were the purposes behind the map? For whom was the map made and why? And this agricultural and vegetation survey of Lewis we're about to look at by Arthur Geddes, who was the son of the sociologist and planner Patrick Geddes, very much reflect this and reflect another interesting era in Lewis's history. From May 1918, Lewis had been purchased by William Lever, first Viscount Leverhulme. And whilst Leverhulme's main priority was the revival of the fishing industry through capital investment, Imaginative plans that he had for rural transformation involved the industrial scale conversion of peatlands into arable lands to make Lewis a, fast, a food producing island. Leverhulme forecast an increase in population from around 30,000 people to nearly 200,000. And Geddes was invited by Leverhulme along with the scientist and farmer, Dr. Marcel Hardy, in the autumn of 1919 to explore ancillary activities to fishing, such as commercial peat cutting, the planting of forestry, and the development of market gardening. The initial survey 
divided the land into eight vegetation categories and was hand colored onto Ordnance Survey one inch to the mile base mapping as part of a detailed written report to Leverhulme. But as with many of Leverhulme's plans for the island, they were arguably too far-fetched. Many of them never materialized, even though the mapping is a rare early example of vegetation and land use mapping in Scotland. Geddes, who became a distinguished sociologist and historian of rural Scotland, in addition to having interest in India and in medical geography, would spend many subsequent seasons on Lewis. And he also went on to publish a printed map at a smaller scale of four miles to one inch in 1934. The agricultural changes that the later book promoted that included this map were more realistic based on a sounder understanding of ecology and climate. Now maps can facilitate resource exploitation in the islands as well as campaign against it. And this can be seen for the proposed Harris Super Quarry, a site only a mile north of Rodell Village on the southern tip of Harris. The main proposal submitted in 1991 was for the largest mineral extraction planning application in the UK, a plan to remove 600 million tonnes of anorthosite used chiefly for road building and in concrete over a period of 60 years from the mountain shown here of Roineval in the south of Paris. And the quarry was set to cover an area of one by two kilometers, extending 370 meters above sea level and 180 meters below. After the sites had been exhausted, the plan was to blast out a sea lock that would have had the highest sea cliffs in the British Isles, six times the height of the White Cliffs of Dover. And these, it was suggested, could become a tourist attraction. With the promise of employment and economic regeneration, locals were initially in favor of the quarry, but later polls evidenced a growing opposition, especially in the local ward. The Western Isles Council originally supported the application too, but they changed their mind by 1995. Numerous objections were raised by environmental groups, criticizing the development from environmental, economic, political, and national grounds. And a montage of what the quarry might have looked like was prepared by Envision 3D, based on this aerographica air photo. And this was used in the 1994 to five public inquiry used a great effect in raising opposition to the quarry proposal. More generally, through our trust in the maps and visualizations like this, encourage us to think and act about the world in a different way. And this gives them immense power. The inquiry lasted five years before in 2000, the Scottish executive turned the application down. Even then the battle wasn't over and it was only following another application and appeal that in April 2004, Lafarge finally withdrew the application and dropped their proposals for the site. It was a close one. And uh, let's change the subject from here by sailing away fast to the south. But here now we find ourselves looking at a declassified and little known military map by the cartographic unit within the Ministry of Defense, showing the danger area of the new rocket range sighted in the late 1950s on South Uist and Bambecula. This site was chosen by the RAF to test the corporal missile, Britain and America's first guided nuclear weapon. Now the decision to site the rocket range here from the 1950s was based on a number of essential geographic requirements, which this map reveals. Most obviously an area of sea extending 250 miles by 100 miles where the rockets would fall. 
an area of sea relatively free from shipping and also containing an uninhabited island. In fact, recently inhabited in the 1950s, the island of St. Kilda. The Hebrides were also a long way from the main centers of British population. And as for many Scottish islands, their perceived remoteness, at least from the south of England, had military advantages. Now, there were many objections and protests at the time from locals, as well as fishermen who fished afar from empty sea. But the scale of the opposition was more limited than it would have been further south. The RAF base has been well used. Over 200 launches of rockets took place between 1962 and 1982, some reaching altitudes of nearly 200 kilometers. In the early 2000s, the airfield underwent an upgrade, allowing it to participate in the Eurofighter Typhoon project, test firing advanced air-to-air -air missiles, and it continues to be actively used for military exercises. So, having dodged the missiles, it's time to turn to the east to have a look at this wonderful map of the small isles, or as Blau has it, some of the smaller western isles between Mull and Skye. Now, Blau's county maps of Scotland are extremely important and valuable things. The earliest detailed maps we have of most of Scotland. But for the Amsterdam publisher, Johan Blau, who never visited Scotland, he had other things too on his mind. For the previous decade in the 1640s, he'd been engaged in bitter rivalry with the Hondius map publishers. And both the Hondius and Blau publishers wanted to boast that they themselves had created the biggest ever world atlas. Blau's solution to an extent was to bulk out his volumes with maps a little like this. Few people, arguably then or now, could possibly think the small isles deserved their own special map and frame, especially when most of the area was filled with sea and there wasn't very much on the islands either. But as a result, the small isles can truly say that Blau put them on the map. It also helped Blau achieve his goal of finally beating Hondius, and by 1662, Blau's World Atlas was the most expensive book money could buy. It had 594 maps and an incredible 3,368 pages of text. We move on, and where would we be without some Admiralty charts on board? Well, one of the most important Admiralty surveyors of the West Coast and Hebridean Islands was a man called Henry Otter. And he spent two decades surveying these difficult waters for the Admiralty. This is the earliest Admiralty chart at Tobermory by Otter. And as was customary, includes views as a guide to navigating into particular harbors. Otter's charts were highly regarded and, and an immense improvement on previous nautical surveys. Whilst in his private life, Otter himself was an interesting fellow, apparently fond of an early morning swim, naked, from the rocks just near the Manor House Hotel today in Oban, where he lived. He was also a member of the Plymouth Brethren, and it was his custom to conduct evangelistic surveys whilst visiting various remote harbours, as well as painting religious slogans on nearby rocks. Visitors to Tobermory Pier can still read in large letters, God is love, which has been freshly painted in the summer since Otter's days. There's also a nice story about Captain Otter when surveying the waters around St. Kilda in the ship HMS Porcupine in 1860. And he had his wife, Jemima, aboard when one of the St. Kilda women, who was called Annie Gillies, was having a, a difficult childbirth. But Jemima Otter went to help and the little girl who was successfully delivered was christened Mary Jemima Otter Porcupine Gillies. Now, even though 
admiralty charts are still rightly highly regarded, they have various limitations and they often don't provide sufficient detail for leisure yachting. This is the admiralty chart, the current admiralty chart for Craggate Bay on the south side of the island of Ulva off the west of Mull. Now the admiralty focus on charts for larger ships. They are also often only partially updated irregularly over time and they can miss hazards, especially smaller hazards close to shore. <clears throat> and this is where Bob Bradfield, a former engineer, has recently addressed this problem as a retirement hobby. Bob surveys popular anchorages and bays off the west coast of Scotland in much greater detail than the Admiralty by crisscrossing specific anchorages and other popular locations in an inflatable boat equipped with an accurate GPS and depth sounder. The raw data is brought together and double checked with a side scan sonar device, then resurveyed if necessary, before the various components are finally brought together in a very readable, extremely large scale chart with colored depth shading. And this Antares chart of Craggate Bay which looks clear at scales of around one to 2,500, is about 10 times more detailed than the Admiralty Survey. Although the Antares charts are unofficial, they follow similar color and style conventions to the Admiralty charts, thereby helping their interpretation and use by their main target audience. Well, Bradfield has now published over 520 Antares charts, primarily for the Western Isles. And with an already wide and enthusiastic user community, he plans to continue surveying and adding to the series. Now, before we say farewell to Mal, it's time to stock up on some provisions, including milk for the cornflakes and a nice opportunity to admire what might be called cowtography on this milk carton. I'm very fond of this map, perhaps because I don't have a very sophisticated sense of humor, but jokes like this really only work once you know your island maps and outlines and a, a geographical shape that we can see here that would be instantly recognizable in Mull. Might struggle to raise a laugh the further from Mull that we go. Scotland's islands have and are, of course, also mapped by other countries for offensive military purposes. If the Russians had wanted to mount an attack on Oban in the 1980s, Oban seen over here to the lower right, this is the kind of map that they might have had with them. The Russian military cartographic unit in this period from the 1940s to the 1990s was without doubt the largest and most impressive of its kind in the world, with over 36,000 people employed in map making work, gathering intelligence for mapping the whole world at different levels of detail. And we know from recent research that this intelligence didn't just include satellite images and aerial reconnaissance, but a wide range of other sources beyond any published maps. The hydrographic information on this, on this particular map is also puzzling as although the position of things like lighthouses shown with a star symbol and major rocks could be found on published Admiralty charts, some of the depths and the underwater contours are not on any published map at all. The declassified Russian military maps, which suddenly became available in the West in the 1990s, present a stark and powerful reminder of the contemporary value of mapping for military activity and how Scotland's islands have, in fact, become steadily more important over time for military reasons. Now, islands can come and go, and some of you may remember the publicity in July 2013 when Google zapped Jura accidentally from their maps of Scotland. 
through a cartographic glitch. Jura suddenly disappeared, just the trace of a road running around the south side of the coast. And predictably, there was much amusement in the local press as journalists contacted locals to check they and Jura were still there. After all, doesn't Google know everything and everywhere? How do we know if, if Jura is really there or not? Would Google Maps really lie? Lisa McDonald, an employee of the Jura Hotel in Craig House, came to the rescue and confirmed that despite their absence from the digital map, Jura was very much there in reality. It's definitely still here, she said. I'm on it at the moment. We're all safe and sound. Now, Scotland's islands all have their own distinctive histories reflected in distinctive maps. But these maps, as we've seen, often reveal more about the historical circumstances at the time of their creation than the landscape itself. And we'll finish off by illustrating this with a couple of examples. The famous Roy military survey of Scotland was, in the words of William Roy himself, a magnificent military sketch. And it was very much intended for military commanders as a reconnaissance view of the landscape. The Roy military survey focused on mainland Scotland as part of the measures to subdue and finally conquer the Jacobite threat. But some islands close to the mainland were included, such as Butte, shown here. Although we may be surprised at the attention to detail in the formal estate grounds around Mount Stuart, the selection of features of military interest, standardized military conventions on color, and interest in terrain and topography clearly emphasize the origin and purpose of the map. Importantly, most Scottish islands were not included in the military survey at this time as they were not perceived as being of military concern in the mid 18th century. We fast forward on a century and a half. And of course, today, most islands have necessarily become more and more dependent on tourism as a source of income. And the better tourist maps of today, such as this one of Aaron from 2003, cleverly use color and symbols to transform the islands into something of a leisure playground. In tourist mapping like this, local culture and some aspects of local history are carefully repackaged into items of curiosity and detached interest for the tourist gaze. The maps reflect a contemporary reality, but it's important to realize that they're relatively recent types of map in our long history of, of mapping the Scottish islands, stretching back over four centuries. So we're soon about to dock again at dry land and time to say a few concluding words on the Tannoy. We've seen how Scotland's islands were made for maps and how important subjects in the history of Scotland's islands can be revealed by maps. Maps and map makers have had an important impact on Scottish islands through the power of their mapping, influencing map users to think and act in different ways towards the islands depicted. Maps define our understanding of the Scottish islands and define the way past generations understood them too. Their shifting names, lines, details, and patterns over time have fundamentally conditioned the way people have come to know of and act towards the islands. This power of maps and their impact is as true today as it was of those produced three or 400 years ago. I'll just say before we finish that if you'd like to read more, then don't forget Scotland Mapping the Islands, published by Berlin in collaboration with the National Library of Scotland in 2016, which organizes things in a slightly more coherent way than my talk today. 
with thematic chapters dealing with particular subjects. So all that remains for me to say is to thank you uh, very much for listening and don't forget to take all your belongings with you. Thank you very much.